Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Fallout this morning. Fears of escalation in the war in Ukraine after President Biden's off-the-cuff remarks that Russian President Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. Mr. President, were you calling for regime change? No. More on the message and the damage control underway as reaction pours in from Europe to D.C. Pushing for peace today, a new round of high stakes talks between Ukraine and Russia as the war rages on across Ukraine. We have team coverage, plus the message from Ukraine's president to Russia ahead of a potential ceasefire deal. Drama at the Oscars, Hollywood's biggest night overshadowed by an unscripted onstage moment. Uh oh, Richard! <laughs> The controversial confrontation between presenter Chris Rock and actor Will Smith, who went on to win Best Actor last night. And rock legend remembered the music industry in mourning over the death of longtime Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins. What we're learning from investigators, plus the tributes pouring in. And we're happy to have you with us on this Monday morning. And we begin today in Washington, where the White House is walking back comments made by President Biden in Poland. In a direct and dramatic finish to his European trip, President Biden called for an end to Vladimir Putin's grip on Russia that sounded like a provocative call for regime change in Russia. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. The White House quickly clarified that remark in a statement, saying in part, here you can see on your screen, the president's point was that Putin cannot be allowed to exercise power over his neighbors or the region. He was not discussing Putin's power in Russia or regime change. NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee joins us now from Washington. Carol, good morning. So, I mean, this is possibly President Biden's most passionate, most stirring speech about the war in Ukraine. But now this morning, the focus is on the White House playing defense about those few words ad-libbed at the end, condemning President Putin. What is the reaction this morning? Yes, yeah, Savannah, this was the, really the capstone to what the White House felt was a very successful trip by the president to Europe at a critical time. He had reassured allies while in Brussels. He had a number of meetings with European officials. He met with refugees near the Ukrainian Polish border. And he gave, as you said, that really impassioned speech, which was stirring and was widely received as as, as very good and, and what and had the messages that folks felt that the president should have brought to this particular moment. But as you said, those last few lines are what is overshadowing everything. And so the White House had to issue that statement, trying to clarify this. And then you had Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveling in the Middle East, being asked about this, and again, having to clarify. Take a listen. I think uh, the President, the White House, uh, made the point last night that, quite simply, uh, President Putin cannot be empowered to wage war uh, or engage in aggression. Uh, against Ukraine uh, or anyone else. As you know, and as you've heard us say repeatedly, we do not have a, a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. So you hear the White House, the administration, really wanting to clarify that the U.S. does not have a policy of regime change in Russia. That's a very distinct and specific policy when it comes to U.S. government. But a lot of people, Savannah, might be looking at this and saying, what is, what's the here to clarify here? You have a president who's called Vladimir Putin a butcher, who mm -hmm. said he's a war criminal, and among other things. And so that would suggest that he doesn't want Putin to stay in power. And yet the White House is saying this is not our official policy. Yeah. And and putting them in this position to exactly that, have to say, no, it's not what we said, it's not what we meant, but but to your point, what do they mean then? Now, Biden's own words right. have therefore put him at these odds with this messaging that his administration has had ongoing with Ukraine. Is the White House now concerned that the president's statement could impact the U.S.'s ability to help negotiate peace between Ukraine and Russia, or could it potentially escalate things? Or to your point, is it sort of just a different version of what we've heard? Yeah, it's it's the concern and the reason why you're hearing them try to clarify this is they're concerned that if it sends the message that the U.S. has a policy of regime change, then could that 
you know, instigate more aggressive action mm -hmm. from Vladimir Putin? Or does that play into Russian propaganda that says that the U.S.'s goal and NATO's goal is regime change within Russia? So that's why they're trying to clarify this, even though, as you said, at the same time, Based on all the other things that the president has said, one would could legitimately conclude that he doesn't think Vladimir Putin should stay in power. And so at best, this is confusing, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. And Carol, quickly, the president's comments come as a new NBC News poll found that seven in 10 Americans expressed low confidence in President Biden's ability to deal with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How's the White House responding to those numbers? Not great. Yeah, yeah, this is not a good sign for the White House. And I got to say, this is also why a moment like this, where the president comes out and says something, and then his aides walk it back, and they right. have to clarify, and there's confusion, just sort of feeds this view that the president maybe isn't the best at handling this crisis. Mm. All right, Carol Lee, thank you so much. Now, on the ground in Ukraine, two missile strikes hit the western city of Lviv Saturday. It's been seen as a safe haven and has been the destination of many internally displaced Ukrainians. It's also less than 50 miles from the Polish border where President Biden was visiting at the time. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Lviv. Gabe, good morning. So one of these missiles hit a fuel depot that's extremely close actually to a residential neighborhood. What else can you tell us about these strikes? Uh, hey there, Savannah. Good morning. Well, yes, the first one came uh, early Saturday afternoon, just a few hours before President Biden uh, was set to speak. And it did hit that fuel depot. Local officials say that at least five people were injured, no one killed. A few hours after that, there was a second strike that hit a military factory. Again, these were precision strikes. But the first one, as you mentioned, Savannah, came dangerously close to a residential area. We saw some of the damage yesterday and the the blast, um, the, the blast wave rather, hit several buildings nearby, shattering windows in that neighborhood, tearing the side off a warehouse as well. Uh, but yes, less than 50 miles from the Polish border, NATO territory, just as President Biden was there. Yeah. Savannah. Now, some peace talks between Russia and Ukraine will continue with negotiations taking place in Turkey this week. And now this comes as Ukrainian President Zelensky says he's prepared to discuss neutrality with Russia. How big of a concession would that be and what kind of impact could that have on the negotiations? Well, Savannah, some mixed signals here from Ukrainian officials. We have been hearing that uh, officials, U Ukrainian officials in the East may have been, and may, that's a big may, may have been amenable to some sort of at least discussion about, uh, you know, the, ter the territory in the eastern side of this country. And some analysts have wondered, could that be uh, a concession, perhaps, whether Ukraine might be carved up, uh, where, you know, Russian-backed separatists in the East might be able to keep uh, that territory. But overnight, President President Zelensky went back to his hard line and saying comments of territorial sovereignty in Ukraine is really a, a non-starter, that, uh, that he is not willing to compromise on that. And just a few hours ago, we heard from a spokesman from the interior minister here in Ukraine saying that he doesn't expect there to be any major breakthrough of these peace talks, but that it's important to continue negotiations. Of course, the fighting is raging in many parts of this country, Savannah, especially to the east and south. Yeah, absolutely. And Gabe, before I let you go, I do want to ask you about something we have an update on this morning. A Ukrainian-American pastor who was reported abducted just over a week ago has, according to his family, been freed. What can you tell us about his release? Yeah, uh, Savannah, we just heard uh, from Dmitry Badyu's family. He is 50 years old. He is a U.S. citizen, a Ukrainian-American pastor who is very well known in the southern city of Melitopol. And his family had told us that he had been abducted on March 19th by about eight to ten Russian soldiers. And they had not heard from him for several days. Well, just this morning, we heard from his daughter. And she says that he has been freed. So some good news there. It is unclear the circumstances of that. No further details were immediately available about his release, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Now, the flow of Ukrainians into Eastern Europe is showing no sign of slowing down. Nearly 4 million Ukrainians have now fled the country, with the majority heading to neighboring Poland. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Warsaw, Poland, with the latest. Hey, Josh, good morning. So, I mean, Warsaw has seen 
a huge influx of refugees. We've actually been hearing for a while now that city officials say they are straining to accommodate them all, to find resources for them all. What's the situation like there this morning, and what do we know about refugees who are waiting for a chance to now get to the United States? Well, certainly, Savannah, Poland is filled to the brim right now uh, with Ukrainians who have fled uh, their homeland and are trying to find somewhere uh, to stay that is safe during this war. Now, President Biden's announcement that the U.S. would take in up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees has given a lot of hope to some Ukrainians who hope uh, that might mean that they can travel to the United States. But it is extremely complicated, as we learned from speaking to some of those refugees today outside uh, the U.S. Embassy here in Warsaw, where there is a long, long uh, every day. Part of the problem is that that 100,000 that President Biden announced, that's not just one program. That is to bring in people through the traditional refugee program, through immigrant visas, through non-immigrant visas, through other uh, avenues of getting into the U.S., including parole, which means if you're in a Ukrainian in Poland right now and you're trying to figure out how do you get to the United States, it is not easy. The process is very long. You're supposed to wait sometimes months for an appointment. And if you're a U.S. citizen who's trying to sponsor a Ukrainian relative uh, to come to the U.S. on an immigrant visa, that immigrant is supposed to make their way somehow to Frankfurt, Germany, to start that processing. And I want you to meet Aaron Errett, who is a U.S. citizen from Florida, who we met this morning. He flew here because his mother-in-law, who's 84 and Ukrainian, she fled to Poland. They've got a plane ticket for her to get to the United States, but they have shown up. Today was the third day they showed up at the embassy trying to find someone to explain to them how she can get the visa she needs. Here's what he had to say. We have her now in Warsaw, Poland, and she's in a wheelchair and a walker, and she's alone, and we have a flight back to the United States in uh, a week, and we can't get an appointment until June 27, 2022. How is she going to survive and be taken care of and we're, we're, we're be left alone here in Poland? And Savannah, for so many of these refugees, visa issues are the last thing they need to be dealing with right now. They're already uh, in a new country. Most of them uh, have left husbands, fathers, brothers back uh, in Ukraine, uh, and they are struggling to figure out what the future is going to look like while also trying to figure out if and when they can get into the United States. Mm -hmm. Savannah? Absolutely. A harrowing process there. Now, Josh, over the weekend, President Biden made several stops to refugee centers in Poland. We saw lots of pictures, lots of videos from those visits. What's the reaction been like to the president's visit? And is the U.S. planning on sending more aid to these refugees and to the countries housing them that, as we said, have strapped resources? Yeah. Well, look, President Biden's visit to this region was very warmly received. We saw Polish President Duda say it was a clear signal uh, of U.S. support uh, for these countries that are really bearing the brunt uh, of this refugee crisis. And to that end, President Biden has announced an additional $1 billion in humanitarian assistance uh, that was recently approved by Congress. It's going to be going to these countries uh, like Poland that are dealing with this influx of refugees. Uh, that in, in, in Part of that will help uh, through USAID, uh, other efforts efforts to make sure people are fed, uh, clothed, and that there are the resources to take in uh, what is really the largest uh, influx of refugees uh, in Europe since World War II, Savannah. All right, Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News and MSNBC military analyst, Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, good to have you with us. So I do want to start with those comments by President Biden saying Vladimir Putin can't stay in power. There's been a lot of blowback to that ad lib, which the White House has been walking back. But here's the reaction from Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S. We heard President Biden loud and clear that U.S. will, is and will be with Ukraine in this fight. Mm -hmm. uh, we clearly understand in Ukraine that anyone who's a war criminal who attacked neighboring country, who's doing all these atrocities together with all the Russians that are involved, definitely cannot stay in power in a civilized world. So, Colonel, what do you make of that response from the ambassador? Do you think this is going to help or hurt the U.S. as it works to bring an end to the war? Well, the ambassador's response, uh, that's exactly what any ambassador from Ukraine would have said. Uh, but I'll be charitable. The uh, the, the president's remarks were probably the least helpful thing he possibly could have said. And if Putin were not paranoid about American intentions before the remark, he certainly is now.
Colonel, I want to turn to what's happening on the ground in Kyiv. Ukrainian forces have managed to repel all of Russia's advances onto the capital so far, even taking back some ground from the Russians. So with peace talks set to resume today, do you think Ukraine has more leverage now at the bargaining table, or do you fear Putin is less likely to bargain from a position of weakness? Yeah, I think the latter. I, I, I'll be surprised if there's any progress in these talks. Uh, Putin is still convinced he can take not all of Ukraine, but most of Ukraine, and certainly the eastern part. Uh, they're bogged down around Kiev because of the Ukrainians' very tough defense and the ineptitude of the Russian forces. They're focusing very seriously on the south, on Mariupol, which is almost totally destroyed. Russia's focus on Mariupol is important for the Russians because Putin wants to control all of Ukrainians' Black Sea, uh, Black sea coastline. And, Colonel, when it comes to Russia's overall strategy in Ukraine, they now say they're focused on capturing the southeastern part of the country. But since then, we've seen those rocket attacks in the west near Lviv. So do you think Russia is truly focused on the eastern part of Ukraine? And what do you think is their motivation right now? Yeah, they're still focused on the east, but they want to disrupt resupplies. They want to disrupt the evacuation of civilians. And that's one of the reasons why they're focusing uh, rocket attacks, indirect fire, uh, missile attacks on specific targets uh, in the West. Uh, at the end of the day, they may have to settle for success in the East, but uh, they're continuing their, uh, the terroristic attacks on civilian targets as well as military, military ones in the West to prevent the resupply of Ukrainian forces. Colonel Jack Jacobs, as always, thank you for your analysis. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Let's turn now to something everyone's talking about this morning, the Oscars last night. The night was overshadowed by a single moment that did not involve any awards. Yeah, at first it had people in the audience and at home wondering if it was even real, yeah. if it was a joke. Will Smith went on stage and slapped comedian Chris Rock for making a joke about his wife. Then a short time later, Smith took the stage again when he won an Oscar. It all started with a joke by presenter Chris Rock directed at Jada Pinkett Smith. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. Moments later, Will Smith rushed the stage slapping Rock. Uncensored clips that aired in other countries showed what Smith said after. Keep my wife's name out your mouth. Pinkett Smith revealed in 2018 she had alopecia, which causes hair loss. About 40 minutes after the stunning altercation, Will Smith won his first Oscar, portraying the father of Serena and Venus Williams in the film King Richard. I'm being called on in my life to love people and to protect people and to be a river to my people. I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my, all my fellow nominees. Love will make you do crazy things. All of it casting a shadow over Hollywood's biggest night, including a historic to. win for Best Picture. Okay. Coda. <laughs> For the first time, a streaming service won the top prize, Apple TV Plus's feel-good feature, Coda. In the coveted acting categories, Jessica Chastain scored her first Oscar, and Ariana DeBose earned the Supporting Actress trophy for playing Anita in West Side Story, the same role that won Rita Moreno an Oscar 60 years ago. You see a queer, openly queer woman of color, an Afro-Latina, who found her strength in life through art. And Coda's Troy Kotzer became the first deaf man to win an acting Oscar, dedicating the award to, to his late father. Dad, I learned so much from you. I'll always love you. You are my hero. Thank you. And the musical performances featured some of the biggest hits of the year and A-list stars from Billie Eilish to Beyonce. It feels so good to be alive. As for that Smith Rock incident, in a statement released overnight, the LAPD said they were aware of the incident, that Chris Rock declined to file a police report, but he could do so at a later date if he chooses to. NBC News is out to both Rock and Will Smith for comment. Haven't heard back yet. The Academy posted a statement on social media saying it does not condone violence of any form, but critics quickly replied saying they believe the Academy did condone it last night. Yeah. 
Now joining us to break down more of the big moments from last night is entertainment journalist and pop culture expert and our friend Brian Balthazar. Brian, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So obviously we have to start with that moment between Will Smith and Chris Rock. So during the commercial break, actually, we know a little bit more. Denzel Washington apparently went over to talk with Will Smith. We'll reference that actually in his acceptance speech. But what do we know about that conversation or, or any more fallout from this incident? Well, Denzel apparently said, be careful when you're at the top because that's when they come for you. I'm paraphrasing there. And Will did obviously reference that during his speech. You know, what's so interesting about the day and age that we live in now is so many people like myself weren't sure what was going on. And so I have DVR. I pause it because the sound, you know, obviously the sensors took out the sound when this incident happened. And initially we saw that Will Smith laughed at this joke. Right. But we did see that Jada did not. And it was then that this unfolded. And it was really hard to believe because, you know, Oscars and award shows like this sometimes have stunts. And it was very mm -hmm. clear even to the, I think, to the audience wasn't sure what was really going on. Was this a bit? Was this a comedic bit? And then it became very clear, obviously, during the censored moments that we could see on Twitter almost immediately afterwards that this was a very real, very awkward and very tense situation that none of us saw coming. It'd be interesting oh. to see what oh, more strange. we hear. Yeah, in the coming days on this. The word yeah. overshadowed is being used a lot. So let's talk about what was overshadowed, some of the other major moments, including Coda making history, the first streaming film to win Best Picture. That's an Apple film. There are also a few firsts in the acting categories. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we have Ariana DeBose, who you saw in that piece there, winning Best Supporting Actress for West Side Story. And what an emotional speech. It was a great, really a great way to start the show, talking about the adversity that she's faced in her career and just in her life. Uh, and coming out on top here. So it was a beautiful, beautiful moment for her. And of course, Troy Kotzer from CODA, Best Supporting Actor. I mean, that speech, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can script something that beautifully. It was just, you know, had the perfect blend of emotion and humor. And it was a really emotional moment for a lot of viewers, I think, too. And it was really wonderful to see that, too. And of course, CODA, you know, being an independent film, kind of kind of the unsung hero of, of films at the beginning of the year mm. to emerge. And then you see Marley Matlin, who was the first deaf actress to win an Oscar, um, to be back up on that stage. I have to wonder what, what was going through her mind, because, you know, you have, there, there's a limited number of roles for deaf actors and actresses. So to see them all up there, I think it was a beautiful moment. Very touching. Oh, absolutely. Now, Brian, the show did receive a lot of criticism this year. One thing that that was about was this somewhat controversial move where the Academy decided to present some of the awards before the televised broadcast began. But then they did edit some clips from that into the show. But overall, how did the move go over? And do you think it's something that will continue next year? You know, I, uh, it, it was kind of clunky a little bit that they then ran that portion of the awards into the show. I mean, realizing, though, that you save a lot of time when you cut out the walk up. And, of mm -hmm. course, some of the speeches were inevitably cut short. So that, that was an issue. But I think we need to accept that the Oscars are going to be long. Let's just accept it. It's one night a year. Let everyone have their moment that we can and try and, do, and, and accept it. It's going to run long anyway. So what's a few more minutes? <laughs> and, Brian, quickly, I want to hit on just a few of the other things that came out. Award shows always have a few political moments this year, we saw the host take aim at the Florida Don't Say Gay Bill, plus the broadcast included a quick moment of silence for Ukraine. What more can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so Mila Kunis, who's Ukrainian, um, came up to talk a little bit about the situation there. And, uh, you know, there had been this uh, pre-Oscars talk about whether or not they were going to invite uh, the president of Ukraine to speak. That was obviously very controversial. Actors voicing their opinion like Sean Penn. Um, so there was a moment of silence and encouragement for people to donate and then, of course, they the host talked about in Florida, this is going to be a very gay Oscars referencing Don't Say Gay. And Jessica Chastain also spoke to uh, the emotional uh, journeys of the gay and lesbian community. So there were a lot of moments there. But, you know, typically there are a little bit of that in the Oscars. So I'm, I'm not surprised at that at all. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Brian Balthazar, a lot to get through this morning for people who maybe, like I did, was asleep when some of this happened. Thanks <laughs> Woke so up to go, oh, yeah. oh, 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 all right. Things got more interesting <laughs> yeah. after I went to bed. All right, a thanks, lot. Brian. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's see if Bill Karen's got some sleep. Get a check on your morning news now, weather. Hi, Bill, good morning. <laughs> No, I was like you guys, too. I was about, you know, I think I woke up about like an hour after it happened, and I was like, 
<laughs> missed it. You know, it's like, <laughs> now we're know, after, yeah. It's like missing the end of a great sporting event. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I apologized at the end of last week for what was going to happen over the weekend with the snow and the cold. And uh, I'm just, I keep apologizing because it's not fun this morning. Uh, there's been snow covering the roads in Connecticut, especially around New Haven. Many accidents on I-95. There's been some snow in areas of Maine. There's a good band of snow uh, coming down between Buffalo and Erie, Pennsylvania. So you get the idea. This is a winter-like morning, and these wind chills are just not fun. Uh, I really hope everyone didn't put their winter clothes away. Uh, there's a saying that goes in this portion of the country. You get like, you know, your first fall spring, your second fall spring, and then finally it's actually spring. So uh, at this point, we must be in like just past our second fall spring because it is winter this morning. Zero in Vermont right now. We're at negative seven up in northern Minnesota and International Falls. And it's not like it's you know any better in, to the south. And we're in the 20s right now in D.C. And even New York is at 12. So so today it's going to be just a, a downright cold day for this time of year, about 20 to 30 degrees colder than it should be. And for this date, these will be the, some of the lowest high temperatures ever recorded on this date. So there's we actually keep records of stuff like that. So only 25 degrees for your high today, the end of March. Tomorrow morning is going to be the same. It's going to be cold once again. And then as we go towards the middle of the week, things begin to get more back to normal and maybe even a little warmer than that. So the big weather story this week, the cold at the start the week but then we're going to watch that storm guys coming across the country we'll talk more about this next hour but unfortunately the tornado threat returns to the south Oof. the same areas mm. that were just hit a week ago all right all right thanks bill so i'm going to keep our eye on we'll see you next hour Coming up, stall tactics on Capitol Hill as lawmakers prepare to vote on Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson. The fight underway between Democrats and Republicans over when that vote might take place. Plus, another boost. What we know about possible plans to offer a second COVID booster shot to some Americans. You're watching Morning News Now. After days of grueling testimony, the Senate Judiciary Committee vote for Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson is set to take place on April 4th. If that vote passes, the nomination will then be presented to the full Senate for a final vote. Judge Jackson would need all 50 votes from Democrats and a tie-breaking vote from Vice President Kamala Harris to join the Supreme Court, unless a Republican also votes for her. If confirmed, she would be the first black woman to hold a seat in the nation's highest court. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now with the latest <laughs> Good morning. So the end of the Senate work period is April 8th. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he yeah. wants to get in the committee vote before that period ends. Any chance we could be looking at a vote for Jackson this week? Where is this going now? Yeah, he wants to do the committee vote and the full Senate vote all before April 8th. The committee vote piece is where things get a little bit slower. And again, when the Senate says they want to do things quickly, that means weeks, not necessarily days or hours. So we got to amend our, our view of how quickly time can pass in the Senate. However, the process as it lays out right now is this. Today is the first day where the judiciary is going to, commit on, is going to meet on the Katanji Brown-Jackson nomination. It's the Judiciary Committee's markup. Then and because of the committee's rules, there has to be a week between this markup meeting and when the committee can actually vote on her nomination. That means Republicans are going to do what they can to slow this down. They are trying to do something over documents being turned over, specifically over sentencing on child pornography cases. Chairman Dick Durbin said last week he wasn't going to let that bog down the process. Nevertheless, what it's looking like is this Monday the 28th is the markup. Next Monday the 4th is the actual Judiciary Committee vote to send her to the full Senate floor. And then hopefully, the Democrats hope, over the course of that week, they will do at some point the full Senate vote, thusly confirming her to the court if they have all 50 Democrats on board, which at this point it's looking like they do. Yeah, let's talk more about that. I mean, we know Senators Manchin and Kirsten Sinema have stalled other parts of President Biden's agenda in the past. Doesn't yeah. look like it this time around. What are we hearing from them? <laughs> Well, look, we heard from Manchin last week saying that he was going to support the Jackson nomination. At this point, no ripples in the water on the Democratic side. The thing we're really looking towards is if this is going to be all Democrats plus Vice President Kamala Harris or if it's going to be bipartisan in nature. Yeah, and, and on, on that note, we know Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell already spoke out about the vote. Let's talk. Let's show what he said about Jackson's testimony last yeah. week. I went into the Senate process with an open mind, but after studying the nominee's record, 
and watching her performance this week, I cannot and will not support Judge Jackson for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. Okay, so we know McConnell is a no there. Do we think anyone is going to break from him, that there could yeah. be a bipartisan vote here? McConnell's a no. He had left the door open just a little bit, maybe giving the rest of his caucus some wiggle room should they decide to get on board here. But of course, he closed the door after the confirmation hearings last week. The only two Republicans that we're really looking at at this point are Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. Initially, you'll remember, Joe, there were three Republicans who supported her to get to the job that she has right now. One of those was Senator Lindsey Graham. You and I both watched those hearings. That's looking like a no based on that line of questioning. But the other two Republican senators who had previously supported her are still at this point on the table. That's where a lot of our eyes are going to be looking over the course of the next few days. That's not to say someone else maybe doesn't come out of the woodwork. Judge Jackson is still meeting with senators this week. At the same time, though, those are the only two Republicans who we could really see getting on board at this point. All right. Ali Vitale. Ali, thanks so much. Now, this week, federal health officials could sign off on a second COVID booster dose for some Americans. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck shows us what that guidance could look like and who might be eligible. Older Americans could have the chance to get a second booster shot to protect against COVID-19. The FDA is not expected to recommend the shot, but will likely authorize it for those over 50 years old, according to the New York Times. The White House acting with hopes of keeping hospitalizations and death rates low. Does it confuse people when it's not specific, if it's sort of left up to you? It does confuse people. We often like to have things pretty clear. It is safer to think about having this fourth shot sooner rather than later. Data from a recent Israeli study supports that idea and shows second boosters can be effective at lowering the risk of death. The study done among older adults found mortality due to COVID-19 during the Omicron surge was significantly lower among those who'd received an additional booster dose. In the majority of states across the country, encouraging signs on the COVID front, numbers going down, but a new and contagious variant has arrived. CDC data shows one third of COVID cases in the U.S. are now the Omicron subvariant BA2, with Nevada, Colorado, D.C. and New York all seeing cases rise. Is the term booster kind of getting outdated? So the fourth shot is basically like a seasonal recommendation. And in fact, I do think all Americans will need to get used to the idea. Medical experts say those eligible for a fourth shot should consider their personal risk factors. For many Americans, a new and important choice. Coming soon, Katie Beck, NBC News. Let's bring back someone we saw in Katie's report to talk about that. Our friend NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, always great to have you with us. So first, just tell us what would a second booster do to prevent severe cases of COVID? Walk us through what it means to add that additional dose. Yeah, this additional dose, Savannah, really takes us back to the antibody levels that we saw after that all-important third shot. With Omicron, we knew that those first two shots, if you had an mRNA vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna, were not enough. You really needed that third shot, the booster shot. Think of this fourth shot as just getting you back to the same antibody levels that you had after your third shot. Keep in mind, though, we still need to see the full data, but the fact that the Biden administration has been so kind of aggressive about this tells you that they don't want to take chances, that we know that that fourth shot is safe, that we know that the harms are low and that the benefits are high, especially for people over the age of 50. Yeah, so this shot would be recommended for exactly who you just said, older Americans. But what about people younger than 50, maybe with underlying conditions? Should they be included in this potential guidance from the FDA or do you think they eventually will be? I do think they will be. April 6th is actually when that formal FDA advisory committee is meeting. That doesn't mean that the FDA won't act sooner to have a recommendation or an option, as you heard from Katie's reporting, about a 50-plus kind of booster shot. But I do suspect that April 6th meeting, which will be, you know, much longer, more details on the data, Savannah, will bring up the immunocompromised. And I do think we will see recommendations for people both under 50, mm -hmm. but also people with compromised conditions. Conditions. Here's my concern. There are not enough people who have gotten their third shot. So th put mm. this in as a plug. The third shot or fourth shot, the booster is important. Get it now if it's time for you to get one.
Absolutely. And Dr. Patel, we just heard in Katie's report also about the concerns around the Omicron subvariant. This is something we're hearing bubbling up, of course, seeing different things happen in cities across the world. But if you're vaccinated or boosted, maybe and boosted, how concerned should you be about this variant? Could this be similar to the Omicron wave earlier this winter or are we in a better place? We're in a better place simply because we've had so many people that have immunity either from vaccinations mm -hmm. or infections or both. Now, having said that, I think if you are in a household with someone under the age of five, someone who can't get the immunizations that they need, someone who cannot build that immune response, you may just want to take precautions because you can get a breakthrough infection. We know that many of us have had one. It's very common. You won't get hospitalized if you've been vaccinated. It's safe to kind of have that normal kind of sense that you can be safe and protected. But you may want, if you're in a crowded space, like I have been over the last week traveling spring break, you may want to put that mask on just to keep your household safe, to keep yourself safe. And remember, millions of Americans under the age of five still mm. haven't had a vaccine yet. All right. Great reminder there, Dr. Kavita Patel. As always, we appreciate you. Thank you. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. Janice Mackey Freyer is with us today from Beijing. Hey, Janice. Hey, good morning. Days after launching what some observers called a monster of a missile, North Korea is signaling there could be more to come. State media is reporting that Kim Jong-un has vowed to develop, quote, more powerful means of attack. Now, the ICBM that was launched last Thursday was the first in four years violating U.N. Security Council resolutions. But diplomacy has stalled. Uh, the U.S. is now adding more sanctions, and that's raising concern that Kim could resume testing of a nuclear device. In El Salvador, they've declared a state of emergency amid a wave of gang-related killings. 14 people were killed on Friday. 62 people died on Saturday. Violence that hasn't been seen on this scale in years. Now, the declaration will uh, loosen arrest rules and suspend constitutional guarantees of freedom. Gang inmates in prisons are also being locked down. The violence is said to be the worst in the capital, San Salvador. And finally, a Brazilian company believes that it has an idea to help save the Amazon. NFTs. The company owns 158 square miles of Amazon rainforest, and it's going to start offering buyers the chance to sponsor the preservation of specific areas of jungle. Now, the token holders won't own the land, but what they will own is key information about preservation, including satellite images. Now, the plot size varies and the price of the NFT varies accordingly. They're going from anywhere from $150 to over $50,000 wow. to kind of own a chunk of the rainforest. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, all right. Yeah. Interesting yeah. idea. Okay. Yeah, at least it's going for something good. We yeah. might be confused by it. <laughs> yeah, we we, don't know we like that. It, yeah, yeah, we get that part. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up on Morning News Now, voters weighing in ahead of the midterm elections. Well, I think as long as innocent civilians in Ukraine are dying, that needs to be a top priority. When we come back, the latest in our county to county series as we hear from voters in one swing state about the issues that matter to them. Stick with us. Welcome back. This week's Meet the Press looked at the reaction to President Biden's unscripted words about how Vladimir Putin, quote, cannot remain in power. Plus, Senator Cory Booker spoke about last week's contentious Supreme Court confirmation hearing for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Here's a look at the highlights with Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd. Let me start with the president's remarks yesterday. Um, and I'm curious what you thought of the ad lib remark when he said, my gosh, you know, Mr. Putin cannot remain in power. Um, how, how did you receive that? We heard President Biden loud and clear that U.S. will, is and will be with Ukraine in this fight. Uh, we clearly understand in Ukraine that anyone who's a war criminal, who attacked neighboring country, who's doing all these atrocities together with all the Russians that are involved, definitely cannot stay in power in a civilized world. Right. Now, it's all up to, for all of us to stop Putin while it's still local in Ukraine because this war is not only about Ukraine and this brutal aggression that is going on for 33 day, days now in every city of Ukraine and especially in cities like Mariupol and uh, north of Kyiv and Kharkiv and others. It's the brutal genocide attempt to 
eliminate or exterminate Ukrainian nation, but also attack, you know, attack on democracy, attack on anyone who wants to live peacefully in their own country. Does phosphorus, the use of some phosphorus bombs to you, cross that line on the use of chemical weapons to change NATO's calculus or not? Well, if we can, if we can verify it, uh, I, I think it is. I think the use of chemical weapons against innocent civilians is something where we have to draw a red line, and we need to do it now, and we need to do it with our NATO allies. Recall we did this in Syria and did not honor the red line. This time we've got to be darn sure that what we're doing is something that will be backed up by us, by our NATO allies. And I do think that's a red line. I think uh, chemical and biolog biological weapons must be. It does feel as if this process is broken. And, and every time we wonder, can these hearings get more partisan, you know, they get more partisan. Uh, and I'll see the finger pointing, this party started it, this party started it. Whatever it is, this system seems broken. What do we do? There were extraordinary uh, uh, realities in the Kavanaugh um, hearings that I think demanded uh, for that to be uh, as contentious as it was and not just uh, allowing it to go through without these extraordinary uh, sort of um, realities coming to the fore and being investigated. So uh, what we saw, though, this week was, uh, to me, uh, outrageous and uh, beyond the pale uh, and very different than what I've witnessed in my uh, short time in the Senate, seeing three different confirmation hearings. And I think that what my some of my colleagues did was uh, just uh, um, sad, frankly. Uh, but again, you had a jurist, a justice, excuse me there, you had a judge there uh, that dealt with it in an extraordinary way and showed America who she is, despite that outrageousness of the questioning. Our thanks to Chuck Todd for that report. Less than eight months away from the midterm elections, and the war in Ukraine is shaping the issues that could drive voters' decisions in November. As part of our County to County series, NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us from Delaware County, Ohio, just north of Columbus. Shaq, so Delaware County has been a longtime GOP stronghold, but that's been changing in recent years. So what's the political makeup of the county now, and what is on the mind of voters there ahead of the midterms? Yeah, good morning, Joe. Well, when you look at voter registration, you see that this is a county full of independent or unaffiliated voters overwhelmingly. But when you look at election results, you see it's a traditionally Republican county, but you notice a trend. In 2016, President Trump won this state, or excuse me, this county by 16 points. But in 2020, he only won it by seven points. So you're seeing a tightening of the margins, thanks in large part to population growth. We talked to some voters here, and that's why we're following this. We're trying to see if this trend continues for the midterm elections. We talked to some voters here about what is top of mind, and we found that while Ukraine is top of the headlines, it's also top of mind for some of these voters. Listen here. If we don't get right what's going on over there, there might not be a here. So I would say, first and foremost, how do we defuse this situation? Let's focus on that. Ukraine. And then let's, absolute. And then let's bring it back domestically. Well, I think as long as innocent civilians in Ukraine are dying, that needs to be a top priority for our The country. top priority. The top priority. That's going to affect inflation. That's going to affect gas prices. Now, that is also a pattern that you saw in the most recent NBC News poll, which showed that Ukraine, these issues that uh, Ukraine is causing and the invasion uh, in Ukraine, that is also raising in terms of voters' priorities. Yeah, and Shaq, I mean, the overall cost of living is higher right now. Gas prices are rising nationwide, all while the U.S. is dealing with this record inflation. Yeah. So the new NBC News poll found 38 percent blame President Biden and his policies for rising costs, only 6 percent blame these on the war in Ukraine. What did Delaware County voters say about all this? Yeah, and you know, one point to that poll that you just referenced, that 38 percent, that was largely comprised of Republican voters. And that was a similar pattern that we saw here, where Republicans were more likely to blame federal policies, where Democrats or independents would see other issues as causing that increase in inflation and the increase in gas prices. Listen to what those voters told us. And I think it does go to the federal level, yes. How about you? Is there something or someone that you blame when you see rising prices? You know, I blame Putin. I mean, I start there. That's who I blame. I mean, you started this whole darn mess. I would say greed, <laughs> corporate greed as well. Um, gas prices have risen, and um, so have the profits of the billionaire um, oil CEOs. 
One thing is many of these voters said they are noticing, they are impacted by the rise in gas prices. So it is important to them, but you see some distinctions in who or what they blame for that increase. All right, Shaq, very interesting. Thanks so much. Coming up, potential home buyers getting some much needed help after the break. More on a new company helping people compete against those all cash offers. In the Music World Morning, legendary Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins, a look back at his life and decades long career. They say cash is king. That's certainly the case right now in the housing market. And with prices at historic highs, buying a home can be nearly impossible for those who need to finance. But now a new type of company is helping those buyers compete, even if they don't have the cash. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock explains. Our country is plagued by a basic math problem. Lots of people are lining up to buy houses, but there just isn't enough supply. Does it feel like a nearly impossible task to do this without some help? I would say yes, because I've tried nine times. <laughs> you were 0 for 9. Uh, 0 for 9. Nine offers for homes, nine rejections. In a hot housing market like Atlanta's, health consultant Kyle Donald got a hot tip nine from his realtor, Giselle. We came in and... It Try was a new company she works with, Homeward. It's one of a growing group of real estate firms that provide buyers with all cash offers, strengthening their hand in competitive bidding wars. The company buys the house, and then Kyle would buy it right back from them through either a mortgage with Homeward or an outside lender. What kind of advantage does that afford to the people coming in with all cash? It, it provides a really good advantage. Um, as we know, in real estate, in the real estate industry, cash is king. Especially as big investment firms are buying up inventory with all cash offers. Just look at the latest trends on who's winning the housing tug of war. In the third quarter of 2020, just more than one in five homes were all cash sales. But a year later, it's more like one in three. And in some cities, it's been even more dramatic, like in Columbus, Ohio, the Phoenix metro area. And at the top of that list, Atlanta's metro, with nearly 70% of homes being sold for cash. Is there a learning process, though? Or are some people kind of spooked by the fact that it's just such a new concept? Yeah, it's definitely some people who are hesitant about it because they're like, what's the catch? Homeward CEO Tim Heil says his business model involves calculated risk with cash as the lure for customers. The company's strategy is to consolidate the various aspects of home buying into one stop shop. We know when you come in and you say, hey, I can close in five days. There's no contingencies with my offer. It's all cash. Um, and when you sign this contract, you can be 100% guaranteed that it's going to go to the closing table. We know that your, your negotiating power goes up in those situations. Of course, the service isn't free. Homeward charges a 1% premium to take on that added risk. For Kyle, that meant $2,600. But after a year of rejected bids, the next one he made was accepted. I will absolutely say that it was worth it. I mean, because I'm standing here now or sitting here now with you, and I'm absolutely happy. There's no place like home, especially when it's yours. Sam Brock, NBC News, Atlanta. Let's stay on your money with our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Dominic Chu is with us this morning. Hey, Dom, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. Well, Amazon is facing union elections this week at warehouses in New York City and in Alabama. Workers at the company's largest Staten Island warehouse are voting through Wednesday on whether to join the Amazon Labor Union. This is a group made up of current and former employees. The National Labor Relations Board will begin counting those ballots on Thursday. Meanwhile, the NLRB will start counting ballots today in the second election of workers at an Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama. You may recall that workers at that location overwhelmingly voted against unionization last year, but later on the NLRB ordered a do-over, saying Amazon exerted unlawful influence over workers there. Results in that election are expected within the next week. Uber has been granted a license to continue operating in London for the next two and a half years. The decision ends a years-long dispute with the city transports regulators, which had previously revoked Uber's license twice. Authorities were concerned about the ride-hailing giant's ability to keep passengers safe. But over the years, Uber has added new safety features to its platform and last year reclassified all its UK drivers as workers instead of independent contractors. London is, by the way, Uber's largest European market. And finally, Heineken, the world's second biggest brewer, said Monday it will leave Russia because its brewing business is no longer viable after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
The brewer said it will transfer its business to a new owner. Heineken had already stopped new investments and exports to Russia and said it would not take any profits from operations in that country. So Savannah, Joe, lots of headlines this morning. I'll send things back over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Heineken joining a growing list of companies that are not operating there. Dom, thank you so much. Now, tributes have been pouring in from musicians across the world for longtime Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins, who died at the age of 50. Hawkins was on tour with the band in Colombia when he was found unresponsive in his hotel room. NBC News senior national correspondent Tom Yamas has more on the tragic loss. He was the pulse behind the Foo Fighters. Taylor Hawkins, the band's rock-solid drummer for more than two decades. With enough charisma to rival even frontman Dave Grohl. In a shock to many, Hawkins was found dead in a hotel room in Bogota, Colombia, Friday, where the band was scheduled to perform. An initial toxicology report found 10 substances in his system, including opioids, THC, and antidepressants. The band confirmed his death in a statement, calling it a, quote, tragic and untimely loss adding, his musical spirit and infectious laughter will live on with all of us forever. An emotional growl seen making his return to Los Angeles this weekend. Hawkins got his first big break in the 90s, touring with Alanis Morissette for her hit album, Jagged Little Pill. Years later, it was Grohl, once the drummer for legendary group Nirvana, who asked Hawkins to get behind the drum kit for his new band. The first time we had a beer together, we were like, we're going to be best friends for the rest of our lives. Together, the Foo Fighters would go on to win 12 Grammys, sell out arenas around the world, and make it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Thank you for letting me be in your band. Hawkins' performance is inspiring even the youngest of fans, including nine-year-old Emma Sophia from Paraguay. Days before Hawkins' death, the young drummer got a chance to meet her hero after her impromptu jam session caught his attention. It was a magical moment. His longtime friend Stevie Nicks sharing a touching tribute on social media, writing, he had a huge heart and a glorious smile. Don't forget us, T. We'll be right here. Thank you, Tom Yamas, for that report. And Hawkins is survived by his wife, Allison, and their three kids. The Foo Fighters were scheduled to perform at the Grammys this weekend, where they are nominated for three awards, including Best Rock Song and Best Rock Album. And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But stick with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.